Welcome to Come Let the Blazing Truth Blind, an event in partnership with Poetry Ireland and Maynooth University, generously supported by the Arts Council of Ireland. I'm Caelan Hogan, author of Republic of Shame. I wrote a book about Ireland's religious-run, state-funded institutions, where thousands of women and children were disappeared into and incarcerated from the first years of the Irish state until as recently as 2006. Poets Anne-Marie Nequiren and Kimberly Campanello had the concept to bring together people who are writing about the ongoing legacy of these institutions through the form of poetry and sound art, which connects us in a unique way to experiences and truths that have been hidden and silenced for so long in this country. While writing the book, I spoke to many people who are still searching for answers about their own identity or trying to access records and information about their origins. Mothers still searching for their children, children still searching for their mothers, and mothers still searching for where their children are buried. The shame industrial complex was cemented in Ireland through doctrine and legislation. The repressive moralism and control imposed by authorities over women's bodies led to generational trauma and loss. How do we make creative work about injustices that are still affecting so many lives in a way that resists passive reflection or sympathy, but instead opens up new space for conversation and action? Come let the blazing truth blind. This line from poet Connie Roberts, who writes about her own experience growing up within one of Ireland's religious run institutions, invites us to bear witness to and shed light on a system that was fueled by shame and silence for so long. Through poetry and sound art, these five artists who are coming together to create this event have found their own ways to articulate truths and experiences that have been silenced in the past, to show how women and children were treated by church and state, and to create a new space for voices to be heard. I think there is real power in the words that they will be sharing with you now, and I want to thank them for creating this work, and thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm a poet and writer and I'd like to share with you three excerpts from a long poem that references various histories attached to St James's Hospital in Dublin 8, specifically that of the old Foundling Hospital of the 1700s. Conditions in the Foundling Hospital were harsh, the death rate was very high and it's said that by 1829 when the hospital closed its doors to new admissions as many as 200,000 children and infants had passed through the site. Many, if not most, died and in fact one winter it was reported that only one child survived. The Foundling Crib 1. By lamplight, an aged map of Dublin reveals the city as preached by Swift. Scant lanes and alleys that run like ghost veins, pulsing the blood of women, who once begged for bread and alms, who cupped their palms to strangers in cutthroat place, in murdering lane. I looked down along the black steps of three centuries or more. I can hear the throb of water rising out of ling and heather bogs. Source is another word for church. In Rome, the poorest mothers left infants by the Tiber and later among the nets, the fishermen found the tangled bones. Did they lay these bones out as treasure? Did they toss them back into water? Every river knows the weight of hunger. 
Anna Liffey, give us back our bodies. The stories of all our mothers are written on the inner walls of this city I call home. Three. In the winter of the great frost, a stillness so cold that even the liffy tongue grew stiff. For seven long weeks, the potatoes turned to rot like teeth in some strange parable. Children stripped bare the orchards, hedges, ornamental trees. The coal ferries waited in the harbour, in the liberties a shortage of wheat the weaver said, as they shook their heads at wool piled up and wheels drawn to a stop. No mercy from the landlord, no mercy from the church. In McCaffrey's field the cows kneel down to rest their bony skulls upon the grass until the last candles in their eyes went out. Those men and women, with a flame left in their heads, flocked to the living tomb, clutching meal tickets like pale love letters to the bone. What obedient servants hunger mix of us in every faith. Outside the tomb's entry, the city foundling crib rocked back and forth in a blade of east wind. Leave here your papist young. Five. One hundred miles, Bridget Kearney crossed on foot to place her newborn girl into the foundling crib, hewn of stone and neatly chiselled. The bell was rung and sun or moon, the wheel revolved, no questions asked. Hush, little bog child, through this blind portal did Bridget look. As the wheel turned, did her hands tremble only the gulls can know the secrets of the dead. Out of every parish and across the Irish Sea, the women came. On the other side, the record states what the porter found, looped to infant wrists and toes, talismanic medals, prayers, names and dates of birth. Now, where no mother stands, I stand, in the milky scent of a butterfly bush that springs like a bruise out of the earth, winters and winters after the wound, an intercession. I am not her, I am mother. She is not forgotten, she is my daughter. So I became interested in this particular site because I live here in Mount Brown, formerly McCaffrey's Field which is located just next door to the former location of the old Dublin Foundling Hospital. But I also have a general interest in the subject of care institutions. My own grandmother spent time and gave birth in a mother and baby home. And my impression is that the Dublin Foundling Hospital, being the first of its kind in Ireland, really helped set the dark tone and atmosphere for the mother and baby homes to come. I spent a lot of time on site writing this poem, trying to get a sense of the space, of the history, and of the memories inscribed into that landscape. The entire poem is quite long and appears in 10 different sections. And so it was important to me to give this dark, complex, tangled history room on the page. In its entire length, the poem is about 200 lines long. And I was thinking of a length that would correspond to the number of years since the institution closed down. The lines are in couplets that rock back and forth on the page. And so this form is haunted, I think, by the mother-child relationship and by the rocking of the foundling crib or cradle, which was installed in 1730 at the corner of James's Street. It was a difficult poem to write and throughout I carried with me the image of Bridget Kearney, who according to records, was a mother who managed to find the means to return to the hospital and get her child back. Bridget is very much the strength and hope in this poem, and the poem ends with the lines, together again, together again. 
My hope is that the Foundling Crib, um, this event extends the tradition in Ireland of bearing witness through poetry and literature to trauma and to suffering. I'm very influenced by the writing of Irish language voices, particularly poets like Nolan O'Neill and others who, since the time of Amerigan, have been so sensitive to the human body as an extension of the physical landscape. I've also been considering, again, in recent times, the work of Paula Meehan, who once said, two lines of poetry can save a life. I really believe in that, and I'm grateful for this event, which I hope will illuminate human experience and bring into the light the suffering of women, children and families in Ireland, and demonstrate how, through a process of craft, we can honour the fullness of human experience. In my debut collection of poetry, Bloodroot, the subject of landscape was very alive in my mind as I reflected on certain questions. What is the relationship between landscape and lyrical control? Between control and imagination? Between the place that I physically come from and the state in which I, as a woman in Ireland today, now exist? Bloodroot is a book dedicated to my foremothers, in particular the women of my family whose voices were not always heard. The title poem references the journey my grandmother took in the spring of 1951 from Northern Ireland down into County Westmeath, where she gave birth to my father at the Castle Pollard mother and baby home. It was here in the same year that Noel Brown resigned as Minister for Health following the failed mother and child scheme which the Catholic Church called anti-family, that my grandmother was forced to relinquish her child to adoption. It's at this point in the history of the state that poetry, as a form of protest, began like a code to write and rewrite itself into the DNA of who I am. For me, the urge to name things and speak aloud comes from a self that predates verbal language or literary skills. It's a desire so bound up in ancestral loss that by the time I learned to write a word on a page, the sensitivity for poetry was already fully formed. Growing up in the 1980s with this type of predisposition was both exciting and terrifying, and all around the atmosphere of the state was potent. I tuned my ear to the tone of family conversations about adoption, records, legal rights and tracing, I observed registered letters, secret numbers, pensive moods. When you live with someone who might be anyone, you learn the mixed up language of fear and expectation. I watched my family roots get traced out of one county and into another, as on the Late Late Show, three girls who were hoping for the Virgin Mary to appear said they too were waiting for a sign. My name is Jess Kavanagh and uh, the work that I'm sharing today is Four Girls in Blue. Four Girls in Blue. Four Girls in Blue face four girls more and they shifted their shoes on a parquet floor. We ditched our classes, a laborious tomb to think of our future in assembly room. Two girls spoke of hostels where you go hang with boys. She spoke of old women left with old toys. Now I wanted the fields where I got up to no good, not a place with the old ones, where High Park stood. The girls said it's basically like hanging out with your friends, the old women are confused and they think they're young again. If you bring them your makeup, your magazines and games, they think they're like you, they think they're the same. Now I was cursed with the youth. When my family were crippled with young deaths around me, I knew no elderly people. When I was 15, I thought, Maybe it's normal to believe you're a teenager, it's elderly turmoil. But it haunted me. And the story hung on from 15 to 33, a story 18 years strong. You see, I believe we are cells, a network of ancestral info, and the story hit the bank of my brain and didn't let go. 
like stories of my nana working as a cook in Hyde Park. She smuggled in comforts to women left in the dark. My nana, who would stand up to a nun's violent throttle, she kept St. Bernadette's halo on a blue water bottle. She had it off in a jaunt before her church bell sang to the Isle of Man with the motorbike gang. Her sister Kay moved to England so she'd be a nurse and dated a black man to our society. She was cursed. A child unwanted, a child out of wedlock, she was sent to the country developmental deadlock. And even now, I have nightmares of being abandoned, alone in some woods, this pain transcended. When I was 13, I found my mother's birth cert. I read out my grandmother's name, and my mom's voice, Kurt, said, Jess, have a fucking think for a second. What is Kathleen short for? Think of a nickname. What are you staring at me for? Kathy, maybe? Was a little ashamed and wasn't smart as my mammy, insensitive to blame, she shouted, K, Jess, Auntie K is what's written. Why do you think she loved you? She was smitten. So you see, my nana Betty adopted her sister's baby. Kay became Auntie Kay and went back to Britain. And the story still stings on the skin of my family, so to respect their privacy, I'll keep the rest hidden. But fuck me, you should be there. When the cousins scattered and afar get drunk together, all beige and ambiguous, and we wonder what the fuck we are. Padre Pio and rosaries. Four black children, malevolence, generosity, wielded the DNA of my family. Tragedy and circumstance, survivor mode, a state of mind and unshook permanence, inherited anxiety, inherited rage, inherited rebellion, inherited wisdom and sage, inherited connection to the women left behind in Hyde Park with survivor's skin and a teenage mind to a system against them, to a system we are told that's finished, irrelevant, but we know unresolved, and to the most powerful man in our state, unable to spit an apology to families unstable. To the girls in blue, to the women in black, to the women who still wake up feeling attacked, know your sisters are close and they hold you while you sleep. That the known and the unknown, the memories we keep, and we will always hold you. We will hold your space for peace and love, for healing and grace. And when those parquet floors are gone, I will sing our song. Because in my DNA, I know something went wrong. And that will always drive me to do what's right. To the white, black, brown and blue girls, we have been born to fight. So um, the poem came, came upon me um, when the wonderful Kaylin Hogan asked me to um, perform on the release of her book. I decided to try and write a poem and to perform this because I'd never done that before in public. So I decided to challenge myself. And I was thinking about different ways in which I could talk about my story and the stories that I would have heard um, growing up in my area, um, in particular about Hyde Park. And there was always this sense in my area that there was whispers and hushes and stories and hauntings and, and different things like that. So one of the memories that um, I thought about and, and that came up when I was thinking about how to write this, this poem about the stories that I would have heard in my area was this particular incident that happened when I was going into transition year. And so the, the kids above who were fifth year, um, who had done transition year the year before, were sitting with us in assembly room and telling us about the different things that we could do for community service in transition year. And there was this old folks home across the way from my school in Merrifield. And this old folks home was called Hyde Park. And one of the, one of the, the young women turned around to me and said, um, oh, it's, it's really cool, actually. I really like hanging out with, with, with these old women because they, they think they're teenagers. And so if you just like play with them like they're teenagers, they really, really enjoy that. And I remember kind of thinking, oh, that's really weird. Why, why would that be? And of course, like after a while, I kind of processed it, processed it and I realised that these were women who had been left in Hyde Park. These were women who were victims of religious-run institutions who had had... Um, children out of wedlock 
who were sent to mother and baby homes or sent to Magdalene laundries, who were then just left there and institutionalized as teenagers and who were now in their 80s or so and in their head they were still teenagers and I just thought that was so overwhelmingly sad and it made me so angry and so I began the poem talking about that particular incident I think stories in families you know Irish families we love talking about different stories and but also there's this element of 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 secrecy and so the, the way that that secrecy was kind of managed, I think, in my family was was to kind of whispers and stories told amongst people one on one, um, you know, maybe after a few drinks or maybe in situations where there was no moment to kind of go, sorry, what? What did you just say? You know, like while driving or like while making dinner where you wouldn't have had an opportunity to be like, can you please elaborate on that? Because that's a pretty big thing to say. And that is kind of one of the, the ways in which my family would have talked about stories and and, and different, different instances and experiences within our family that shaped us. And so I very much wrote it from the perspective of these are all stories, these are all narratives, these are all memories that have been filtered through multiple generations. And then how it, how it affects me, how it has affected my empathy, how it has affected the way I process my trauma, how it has affected my personality and, and my creativity and how it has affected what I want to do and how I want to help these communities. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> and my family, my family history is complex. And then my maternal history is complex. My paternal side is also quite complex as well. And there's a lot of secrecies there's a lot of things that just are unknown and they're unknown because people have not talked about them because people don't want to talk about them because people have weaponized privacy and also because of the religious run institutions who have refused to give out documents or to fill out documents correctly and so you know because of this maelstrom of 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 lack of comprehension i you know identifying who i was growing up was was difficult and then you take into the race side of things and the racial identity side of things and being somebody who is light passing and who is also um, somebody of, of African descent. You know, people would always ask me these questions and kind of would, would project their perception of my racial identity onto me. I did not have, as I would always say, the linguistic arsenal to say, no, I'm not and, and elaborate on the no. I could say, no, I'm not white. And then they would go, yes, you are. And then I didn't know what else to say. And I didn't know how else to articulate my identity. And so being able to educate myself, having a culture now that is so much more able to talk about racial identity and different types of identities in a way that is clearer and that is um, you know, empathetic and that is uh, intersectional. You know, and so as a result of that, I feel so much more in my power to be able to talk about who I am and to embrace the, the multiplicities and the hybridities within me. And so when I say linguistic arsenal, it is it is embracing my full multiplicities and being able to talk about it in a clear and articulate way. And that took time and it took learning. And I'm grateful that my generation has had the opportunity to do that. My, my name is Vicky Langan and I'm a sound artist based in Cork. Um, I'm from the west of Ireland originally and um, my practice is mostly concerned with sound, um, especially with field recordings, um, recorded sound of places and also performance and film. Um, 
And for this event, I'm sharing a recording that I made back in 2014 that I didn't share until a number of years later. Um, and it's an intensely personal piece, very specific to my own um, family history. I grew up as an only child in the west of Ireland and when I was still quite young I discovered accidentally that my father was Anne Lovett's boyfriend back in the 1980s in Granard in County Longford and that he had left town just after she had tragically died and um, that was not long before he met my mother um, and I grew up carrying this enormous secret knowledge and um, couldn't speak about that to anybody and uh, all throughout my teenagehood and my 20s I researched everything I could to do with Anne and Granard and her death and the town, the aftermath, the inquests, um, just looking for clues to try to glean some sense of um, truth um, or clarity about what had happened. Um, and I even searched in poems and songs and artworks looking for these clues which I know now is um, kind of fruitless, you know. Um, Um, then in 2014, I decided to travel on my own to Granard. Um, I don't drive, so I took several buses across the country to get there. And it was very, um, very intense experience. I felt like... Um, like I was undercover and um, very very strange feeling um, walking through that small town making my way up the hill to the church to the grotto and um, because my practice and my life is so bound up in recording spaces and recording the sound of myself in spaces it felt very natural to take out my microphone and set it up and walk away and just sit there and listen um, and so Here's how I described that piece when I first shared it back in 2018. Um, just, just as my father came forward with that monumental interview he did with the Irish Times and Rosita Boland. Um, so in 2014, I visited Granard on Anne Lovett's 30th anniversary and recorded the sounds of the place where she gave birth alone and scared in the cold and the rain at 15 years old. Where her baby Pat 
died is stillborn and asphyxiated where Anne's body went into irreversible shock where she knew she was going to die. I sat there and listened to the crows in the fir trees that surround the grotto, a dog crying in the background, the church bells, the quiet. You, you can hear my presence in the recording. Um, you can hear my footsteps and my sniffling. It was a very cold day. Um, and it feels like a recording about Anne and it could just as much be about me and my family and about Ireland and small towns but I never intended on sharing it it was just after my father's interview the right context context had come about you know in order to share the piece. And in the context of this discussion about ethical considerations or people working with traumatic histories and these um, intensely personal areas, I found it very interesting, if a little disappointing, the number of people who got in contact after the piece went up online to ask if they could use it as um, background, kind of ambience for their own projects and works. And um, I felt very strongly that this piece has power. And um, the power is in how stark it is, how desperately sad it is. And that would become reduced um, if it were to be behind somebody's words or foisted kind of narrative. And so when we think about ethical considerations about working with these deep energies I would like people to consider or maybe resist the urge to beatify and ventriloquize corpses and the abused and um, you know, when our social history is this black and this toxic, to ask yourself if your artistic gesture has enough clarity and conviction behind it to truly pierce something, um, or are you just adding to the swamp? of of unknowing of vagueness of confusion and cover-ups and um, but anyway um, I hope you enjoy the piece
I'm Kimberly Campanello, and I am talking about my work, Mother Baby Home, which is a 796-page poetry object that engages with the St. Mary's Mother and Baby Home in Toome, County Galway. And this work comprises several different approaches in order to address this subject. First, it's visual poetry, poetry that takes work and makes it visually interesting on the page or visually suggestive on the page. It's also an example of docu-poetry. It uses archival material uh, in order to engage with the subject matter of that material. It's also a kind of asemic writing, so some of the poems are overlaid on each other, uh, making it really difficult to read, and in other, in other places the work is actually redacted uh, and covered up. Uh, and as it is, would suggest, the 796 pages creates a huge amount of blank space, of white space, uh, which echoes the silencing and the silence around uh, the, the subject matter. It's also a work of endurance art, so it took me uh, five years to do it, uh, from the time in 2014 when the story initially broke until 2019, in February 2019, when the um, many times delayed report was finally due to be released. And so the way I approached it was to gather all the materials that were related to the home. And I'm grateful to Catherine Corliss for sharing with her, with me, um, her uh, collection of files and materials and archival work dating back to the original construction of the home. So that material all forms a part of the poetry. And then what I did was I created um, Google alerts to my email anytime the words tomb and mother and baby home appeared on the internet, I got an alert. And that created a whole nexus of materials that then also linked to further materials to things like the Klon report or other um, blogs or other posts by a variety of voices. And the overall aim with this was to sort of make myself as a poet and my voice disappear and subordinate to the many voices around this subject matter. And that felt particularly important to me as someone who's not experienced um, the, the issues that Toom contains, but who has an ethical obligation um, in terms of human rights and as, as an artist to, um, to those issues. And I felt that Poetry in which the poet is trying to express some sort of wisdom or some sort of idea or some sort of argument was not the route that I wanted to go down. And instead, I wanted to make a commitment to the work, to extend that work over a number of years, which is what I did, and then to perform the work in a durational way. So as I said, it's a durational performance that runs over three hours. And so it acts as a kind of a ritual space in which the many different voices that are involved in uh, the perpetration of, of these atrocities, the experience of these atrocities, the aftermath, um, government institutions, uh, religious institutions, the media, all the different ways in which multiple voices are addressing the subject, all of those voices are jostling for space within the context of um, Mother Baby Home. And so in the actual performance of it, which goes over three hours, these voices are brought together, are juxtaposed against each other, are um, arguing with each other, are um, conversing with each other, are in many cases, when I start splicing voices of survivors with the government's um, quite uh, legalistic and um, kind of bureaucratic language, it becomes even clearer uh, the urgency with which these issues need to be dealt with and the fact that um, the, the way it's being discussed is, is simply not uh, sufficient. And so the overall aim, as I said, was to pull it out of the world of um, the single poem and to move it towards the world of a report. So the subtitle for Mother Baby Home is actually a report. And in a way, it's a report on the report. It's a report on the unfolding aftermath from 2014 to 2019, while that report, which was being put together, which of course, when the actual report came out, 
um, in all, all of its, its devastating um, contents, but also the ways in which things were framed in a completely inaccurate way and the ways in which survivors' voices were treated. Um, it, it, I hope in some ways that Mother Baby Home is, is an alternative report that actually foregrounds um, the, the inherent need for, um, for justice, for redress, for all the things that, that survivors are asking for and that, that they need to be listened to. Um, and so the overall way in which I approached it was inspired by uh, docu-poetry like Thomas Kinsella's uh, Butcher's Dozen on the Widgery Report. It was inspired by the work of Susan Howe, who deals with archival material in her work. She's an uh, American poet of, of Irish heritage. And it was also inspired by the American poet H.D., who engages in ritual um, practice in her poetry and tries to sort of um, address the, our most human needs through these major kind of epic poetry. And so I see the work as something that exists as something visual, as something performative, and as something textual that can be read. So um, it's it's been recorded in its entirety, the uh, performance by University College Dublin Irish Poetry Reading Archive and can be viewed on YouTube. And I think it's important to listen to it uh, in that context because, as I said, the juxtaposition of voices is really is really vital. And the, the time and the way that the voices are stretched out and overlaid onto each other visually and sonically is one of, is one of the aims of the work. Um, it, overall, the aim for me was to make something that was both intricate and kind of a monument. So something that had almost a quality in some of the visual poems, I think you can see, almost the quality of kind of lace or kind of needlework or the kind of detailed work um, that that uh, is very fine, finely done, but then also the monumental quality of the the oak box, um, which echoes, of course, um, the cradle or 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 the, or the coffin, which which, as we know, uh, many of these children were denied. And I, as an individual, as a person, I I feel in some ways connected to these narratives, even though it's not my experience having grown up going to Mass at the University of Notre Dame's Basilica, which the narratives, uh, the Catholic narratives around shame and around the body and around sexuality and the narratives that deny erotic autonomy to women and that circumscribe lives in particular ways felt, has, has, has always felt very present to me and the way in which that, that contact between North America and Ireland uh, exists through through the church's discourse, I think, was a big part of why I was uh, personally uh, drawn to this. And I was fortunate enough to have been able to air the work over the years that I was writing it at a number of different venues. So the Irish Literary Society in, in Bloomsbury, at a number of festivals in the UK and in Ireland. And at each, uh, at each festival or in each context, I would be um, I would discuss afterwards um, with people who attended, many of whom who were survivors themselves or who were affected by institutions, or people would contact me afterwards via email. And so the dialogue that is ongoing uh, around, um, around this is, has been really um, vital to the work as well. And of course, I have to thank Una Young, who um, allowed me to give the first durational performance in April 2019 uh, in, in her gallery. And I was, I was blown away by the way in which the work um, had people coming and going and experiencing it um, for, ver for various amounts of time and the, and the people who stayed afterwards. So I, the, the overall aim of it, as I've said, is to evoke the sense of the weight of this, of this tragedy and the weight, bureaucratic weight, through the 796 pages um, of, of that material to evoke the sense of the immensity of this, but also to give that sense of love and care and endurance um, through the, the time I spent doing it and through the way in which uh, it needs to be performed and the way in which the demands it makes on the reader and on the poet uh, and on the performer I think are essential to the kind of work it is and the kind of work that needs to be done. Hi 
everyone. Greetings from New York. I'm Connie Roberts. I'm delighted to be here with you all today. I hail from County Offaly and I grew up in an industrial school in the Irish Midlands. I'm one of 15 children and all of us moved through the industrial school system in Ireland. I emigrated to the US in the 1980s and for the first nine years I was undocumented but I was lucky enough to secure a Morrison visa eventually. I teach creative writing at Hofstra University on Long Island. I'm honoured that the title of this event, Come Let the Blazing Truth Blind, is from my poem, Inheritance. I wrote the poem, Inheritance, to memorialise the 35 young girls who perished in the Poor Clare Orphanage Fire in 1943 in Cavan Town. It's a fairly long poem at eight sections, but I open with a five line stanza by way of introduction. It would be easy to saccharine their deaths with morning dew. God knows it could happen to a bishop or a poet, but I won't sing of winged angels and burnished gold. I won't tell it slant, come, let the blazing truth blind. Fans of Emily Dickinson, of course, would recognise my nod to her poem, Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Dickinson continues, The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. In my poem, Inheritance, the speaker outraged by the needless deaths of 35 girls in an industrial school, refuses to tell it slant, to tell it obliquely. She refuses to use the flowery language of the Bishop of Kilmore, who, at the Requiem Mass for the 35 children, said, Dear little angels, now before God in heaven, you were taken away before the gold of your innocence had been tarnished by the soil of the world. The speaker of the poem wants you to see the children on their knees in the smoke-filled dormitory, hear them coughing out prayers as they recite the rosary. She wants you to hear the exact words taken from court documents of the voice at the top of the stairs shouting to townsmen who came to rescue the children. Go back down, do you hear me? Go back down. She knows the image of the 35 charred bodies in the eight coffins might be too much to handle, might indeed blind. I use the word blazing not only in reference to the orphanage fire but also to reinforce the emotional intensity of the speaker's voice. Blazing as in anger. Let the blazing truth blind. In other words, let the feckin' truth blind. I'm not always as in your face in my work as my inheritance poem suggests, but I strive to tell the truth always. Here's another truth packaged slightly differently, drawing on the dramatic monologue and the satirical. It's a poem entitled A Modest Proposal, inspired by who else but Jonathan Swift. What can I tell you? There's a lot of nodding goes on in poetry. The truth that I'm telling in this particular poem is that the industrial school system in Ireland was devoid of love and nurturance. When you broach the subject of institutional abuse, your mind might automatically conjure up images of physical or sexual abuse. But the lack of of affection and emotional nourishment in these institutions has far-reaching and devastating effects on the individual. 
we remember in every sense of that word the great famine in Ireland but we don't talk enough about the great hunger children suffered in our institutions starved of kindness of touch of love in my poem a modest proposal I take on the persona of the resident manager of an industrial school she's modeled after the head nun who ran with an iron fist the institution I grew up in. A modest proposal from Sister Mary Concepta, resident manager, Mount Carmel Industrial School. And what about love, you ask? Hmm, can't say the thought ever crossed my mind. You know our task here is enormous. Don't want to boast, but have you ever seen a more well-fed, well-dressed bunch? Well, well, have you? But I'm not one to ignore the needs of the children. Do tell if I don't have your answer to your question about love. Now, I'm sure that you will concur that nothing speaks more of love than a dog. Yes, a dog, a furry friend, a pet. I propose that each nun in the convent pick a child from the yard to dote on as one would do a pet. Hush, no argument. Children would make terrific dogs. Well, to be precise, pups. Sister Benedict is partial to a mongrel terrier. Sean O'Brien and she, I think, would click. Sister Aloysius is a fusspot. She'd want more of a pedigree. Florrie McCann would make a grand lapdog sit quietly as Sister watched TV. Reverend Mother could have Jack Russell. She could take him to the priest's house for tea. Provided, of course, he didn't smell or shed hair on the reverend's settee. Each pet would have a collar and leash with a name tag round its neck. Nuns could take their dogs to mass if they please. They could howl in the choir. What the heck? They could groom the poor creatures, put their hair up in bows, feed them treats from their pockets and walk them down Main Street on Sundays. Share a love that's unique to owners and pets. As Mother Macaulay ministered to the poor, her sisters can carry on her good deeds. Through their love and attention, they would, nuns will ensure they meet more than the children's physical needs. It would be funny if the reality wasn't so sad. Continuing with the blazing truth metaphor, I'll conclude with a more recent poem inspired by the Notre Dame Cathedral Fire of 2019. I was struck two years ago, as I'm sure many of you were, by the outpouring of love and grief from around the world for the damaged cathedral. And I thought, what if the child who was hurt into the world was so treasured, so loved. The child in the mother and baby home, the child in the industrial school, the child in the Magdalene laundry, the child in the county home, the child in their own home. The poem is entitled In the Ideal World and it opens with a quote from the President of France. In the ideal world, for every child hurt into life. And the epigraph. Like all our compatriots, I am sad to see part of all of us burn. More beautiful than before, we will rebuild. President Emmanuel Macron on the Notre Dame fire. You are our sanctuary, little one. 
a symphony in stone. You are the three rose glass windows, 16 copper statues. You are Christ's crown of thorns. If anyone should harm a hair on your head, citizens will take up vantage points on the bridges by the river. In the plazas and squares they will drop to their knees, sing Ave Maria's weep. Prime Ministers, Presidents, Queens and the Holy See will express sympathy. Speeches will be cancelled, truces called. Wealthy businessmen will pledge billions for your restoration. You are Christmas and Easter, little one, the doves in the belfry. You are the bells at the end of the war. The gallery of kings, Louis's tunic. You are the gold cross still standing. I leave you and love you all on that note of hope. Thank you. Lauren Arrington. I'm Professor of English and Head of Department at Maynooth University. We're delighted to partner with Poetry Ireland and the Arts Council for this event on poetic responses to the legacy of Ireland's religious-run institutions. Much of the work in our English department is focused on literature's engagement with contemporary and historical crises in inequality, in nationalism, and in isolationism. Indeed, this is the theme of our master's degree, Literatures of Engagement. The human rights violations of the Irish mother and baby homes, alongside other institutional systems run by the church and state, reflect a crisis in civil society in modern Ireland. The writers here bear witness to historical memory and present trauma, and they help us to understand our collective responsibility. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.